So I like uh, starting with questions because it gets people talking. So uh, the question tonight, uh, not un completely unrelated from something Mark was talking about. So does anyone know what your name means? Or did you name any of your children because of a specific meaning? Or do you have a name that you like its meaning? Anybody? No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> Nobody knows what their name means. Okay, so Jared means uh, descent or descendant. Um, I don't know. He was a really old guy in the Bible. I'm not sure if that's where that comes from. We named our oldest child Caleb. Uh, Caleb means dog. Um, dog. Yeah, dog. Yeah, I sometimes, you know, think of him as a dog. I don't, I don't know. Not really. No, uh, we didn't really name our kids based on meaning. We went more with, like, whether we liked how it sounded or, uh, actually, if I'm honest, it's more like, did we know people that we liked who had that name or it was more like we had a particular name we liked we're like no I knew someone who <laughs> couldn't stand him. No, um, uh, I, I was looking up this afternoon some some things about names uh, Cameron was an interesting one to me uh, that one means broken nose or uh, or crooked nose or broken nose or crooked river um, so that's that's an interesting one um, there were, there were some other ones that I wasn't quite sure about. If you ever got onto these websites, now I'm, I'm guessing you guys probably don't spend a lot of time looking at name meaning websites. But if you did, uh, some of them are really sketchy. Like I'm pretty sure some of them are just completely made up. It's just like someone thought, oh, this will make someone feel better about naming their kid this. And so they, they choose these things. But I, I wanted to, to start there uh, tonight because we're, we're, we're in uh, Genesis 16 and 17. Uh, tonight, and n some names play a really prominent role, and uh, the, I, I had one of two ways I was thinking about going with the lesson tonight. I decided to go the name route. Uh, I'll tell you the other one at the end, and um, I think I made the right decision, but you can, you can tell me if I did or not. Um, but uh, e even today, um, in the Hebrew culture, in the Jewish culture, uh, names play a, a really significant role. And uh, in fact, most Jewish kids, at least in the more traditional, um, uh, uh, strict uh, sects of, of Judaism, they'll have a secular name, but then they'll also be given a Jewish name and their, uh, their, their, their sacred name. And those names, um, there are even some people who uh, think of it as a, 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 an act of prophecy in, in a way that, you know, we see in scripture a lot how people would sort of live up to their names. Uh, and some people believe that, that it, some uh, Jewish uh, people today even still believe that uh, even though God doesn't directly speak to them in, 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 in prophets anymore, uh, that, that the names that they give their kids are a way that he works with them in, in having some amount of prophecy about what the, that, that person's life is going to be about. I, I don't know if I, I really buy into that, but, uh, <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. Um, so so we're, we're in uh, Genesis 16. Um, you, you, I think we all know this story pretty well, uh, so we're going we're gonna to skip reading the first part of it here. Uh, this is, you remember, uh, Abram and, and Sarai were uh, really frustrated, right? They had, had gotten this promise about uh, going to have uh, a bunch of kids, and let's, let's actually start with their names. So that's where we're going to talk about a lot of names tonight. So uh, Abram, does anyone know or have a footnote in your Bible or uh, know off the top of your head what the, what the name Abram means? I know you didn't come prepared tonight for the name quiz. <laughs> no, so, so, the, so the name Abram you know, means exalted father, or, or like a, a that, that's what it means. So if you, if you think about, and, and Sarai uh, means a princess or a princely. Um, it's a, a form the, of the, the Hebrew word uh, sar. Uh, it's a feminine form of that. So sar uh, means captain, chieftain, commander, some sort of like ruler. And, and uh, Sarai is a, a, a feminine form of that. And the, uh, so I, thinking about this, I don't think I ever realized until today, uh, I always like having those things that, you know, I learned later in life because uh, maybe I knew this once in a while and forgot it because I'm getting older. But the, uh, I never thought about the fact that Abram went through his whole life up to this point, right? And uh, think about when you introduce yourself, and Abram, Abram would introduce himself to people and say, Hi, my name's Abram. 
And, uh, you know, which in their language would mean exalted father. And I would imagine that the next question would be, well, you must have some great kids. <laughs> He's, here he is, an 86-year-old at this point, and, and his answer would have to be, no, I don't have any kids. His name was Exalted Father, but he had no, no children at this point. And so, for, you know, we often think about the ridicule that, that Noah probably endured when he was building the ark and how people would have asked him what he was doing. I wonder if Abram got any of that. You know, I'm just speculating. I, I don't, you know, there's nothing in Scripture that says anything about that. But, uh, but it just makes you wonder that he, he had this name, and for a long time, how many times did he have to explain to people that his name was Abram, but he didn't have any kids? He's got this promise, but he doesn't have any kids. And uh, in the, the same with, with, with Sarai as, as sort of a, a ruler. She's a ruler of what? Um, so she has a, a, her house in some sense, but, but no, no lineage after her. And so, so, you know, they're really frustrated. Dave, did you have a, something you want to... Yeah, I, I think it's a mix, right? I, I think that, uh, like in the case of, of Abram, um, I'm probably going to get these wrong. If anyone here is a Hebrew scholar, I'm going to say all of these words wrong. Um, but I think it comes from two, two root words. One is, is Av and Ram, um, which really literally mean like exalted father. So it could be that, uh, that the language changed and in, in that it was recorded. I mean, uh, we, if we understand, you know, depending on whether we take an early date or a late date for the Exodus, you know, Moses was writing this somewhere 1200 to 1400 BC. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, had the language changed in the, you know, three, 400 years since Abram was there, that he was sort of transliterating or, or translating from what his name was to, to that? I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I think there are some, some people like Jacob that, you know, he seems like he was probably named, you know, supplanter, deceiver, the one who grasps the heel you know, because of what happened during his birth. And, and that was actually a really common thing for, for Hebrew children to be named either for something that was happening during their birth, for some uh, festival that they were born during, or something that was going on around that, that time. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. So, so here's a great example of uh, uh, Hagar is, is one of the, um, or Hagar, and maybe Hagar's the comic strip. Uh, yeah. Hagar, uh, I, I don't know how you say that name either. But uh, Hagar, if you look up today what Hagar means, it means forsaken. That's what you'll see if you look it up. I think that one is a case where it means that because of Hagar in the Bible, that um, the, the two sort of root words for Hagar or ha and, and gar, which would mean something like the reward. And people think that Abram picked up, you know, Hagar as a, a servant when they were in Egypt. We're told that she was an Egyptian servant um, and that she was given that name as because her reward was being able to be a part of Abram's family. Um, but again, you know, some of this is, is speculation. But yeah, sure. How old is the oldest man mentioned in the Bible? Do you mean the one who lived the longest or the... He was the... Yes. He died at... Yeah, 969. Jared came in at close second at 962. Most people don't know that. <laughs> He does. And, but no limit yeah, well, we do have to kind of make. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, that's the. But pre flood, we saw all sorts of people living seven, eight, nine hundred years. Um, after the flood, it's uh, more like the. 120, 130 ish years is about as long as I think we, we see. And there's a, the, yeah, I, I, I did not look that up. 
So I <laughs> don't be definitive. Yeah, so, so what we know is that at least, uh, and, we, and we'll get to this a little bit more uh, in a bit, but at least that both Abram and Sarai th definitely believed that they were well past childbearing age. And in fact, it states sort of explicitly that, that Sarai was past menopause and it, they would have been shocked if they had had children. Whereas that, that was not the case for like Methuselah and you know, the, the folks back then. They, they were having kids you know, when they were four, five, six hundred years old. <laughs> And, and so, you know, at least it, it, it would have been very strange. So uh, by all, uh, all uh, signs, they were really old. Like, 86 was really old at this point in, in, in history. Um, so the, so what, what we see in this, this part, right, is how they, they get frustrated Right? And so because they're, they're not seeing the fruits of the, uh, the promise, and so they decide they're going to take it into their own hands, and Sarai gives Hagar to, to Abram and says, you know, let's, let's do this this way. Um, I did, uh, was doing some reading uh, this week, and, and this was apparently a, a very common practice in that time, in that uh, area of the world, for, uh, you know, if you had a woman who was barren, uh, to take a, uh, another woman and, and sort of add them into the mix because you wanted to continue your lineage. You didn't want your, you know, your line to die out and all your wealth and everything to go away. And so this is a very common thing. I, I think the way we should look at this, uh, or one of the ways we could look at this, is that they, instead of trying to follow God's uh, plan here, they followed the way their culture said they should find the solution. And so, you know, we, we look back at them, I think very, it's very easy in our eyes, at least in my eyes, to look back and then say, why would you ever do anything so crazy? Like, why would you ever, like, think that this is a good idea? Like, Abram, when Sarai comes to you with this idea, like, just say no. Like, this, this is not going to work out. Like, it's not a good idea. Uh, but then I think about my own life, and I think about how many times have I taken our culture's solutions rather than God's solutions? And how many times have I uh, heard the voices of all the people around me saying, oh, this is okay to do it this way. Uh, it's okay to take the shortcut. It's okay to, you know, lie a little bit on your taxes or, you know, that sort of thing. I'm not saying I lie on my taxes. I, I don't. I don't. Um, but, but, you know, that sort of thing, I, I think we have to try to understand it in that sort of context, that it's the, um, it's the, it, was, it would have been a very natural thing for their society to have done, and they were just doing that even though, uh, you know, that was sort of the whole point of what God was trying to do through Abram, was to say, I'm going to set you apart from that society. I'm going to pull you out of this, all of this wickedness that's all around you, and I want you to do things in a different way. And he was going to do it through him in a different way. Yes, Sarah. And that's also easy for us to maybe morning quarterback that because we have the experience of seeing thousands of years removed from that. But it's really easy for us to I, I think that's a great point. Yeah. So, so let's read some about the, some of the fallout. So after, you know, uh, Sarai starts treating uh, Hagar uh, very harshly, and, and so Hagar uh, flees. And uh, could someone read uh, chapter 16, verses 7 through 16 for us? And I want you to especially try to pay attention to names. And we'll try to pick out some names that show up in here. So 7 to 16. Where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. And the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also had said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man, 
His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Barak. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was eighty six years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Thank you. So but before we dive into the names, I, I want to point out um, in uh, verse uh, 10, the language that's about uh, surely multiplying the offspring so that they can't be numbered, uh, this is very similar, right, to the language that Abram received in the, in the promise just back in chapter 15, right? I think that's very intentional uh, by both God who was saying it and the, the writer here who was making these parallels. Not that Ishmael is the son of the promise, but that he is going to share in the blessing uh, because he is a, a son of, of Abram. Uh, okay, so what names did we notice in here that are important? Well, they're all important. But... Ishmael. Ishmael, okay, so that's the easy one. So, uh, what, uh, so what does Ishmael mean? God hears. God hears, yeah. So here we have uh, uh, Hagar as she's responding, right? She, if we think about her, her frame of mind here, right? She's uh, running away from Sarai, and then she gets this response, uh, to go back, but she, as she's going back, she has a little bit different frame of mind now, because now uh, she's gotten this assurance from God, and she understands that God sees her, and I think it's really interesting that um, the, uh, uh, the name Ishmael is different than, than what she then says after that, so he, she, he says to call her, um, his name Ishmael, uh, but then later she says, you are God uh, who sees me. And so there's this, but the, the idea I think is the same, that it's the, you know, God is one who is aware of, of suffering and he knows what's going on here. He was not, it was not news to him that Sarai was, was treating her harshly and she was being, you know, uh, having to run away. He knew that this was happening and, and he, he heard her cries and, and, uh, and listened. Um, so, so I guess I, I kind of pointed to the one of the other names that shows up here, and that's that's the one that uh, that Hagar uh, gives to God, in a, in a sense here. Um, she uh, she says, "You are a God of seeing." Uh, it, if you know, God has a bunch of names that show up in Scripture. Uh, this is one of them. This is El uh, Roy or El Roy. I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, if anyone knows, please tell me. Uh, but, but this is the God who sees, or the, God, the seeing God, or the, the God who sees me. This is one of those things that, um, and by her specifically calling it out as a, as, a, as a name of saying, God, you are the God who sees, she is, is um, speaking her belief about the existence of that character of God, of, of understanding, it's, it's a sort of an affirmation from her of here's what I understand about who God is. You sort of see that he reveals himself to her in this way, that uh, through this angel coming and talking to her and giving her this promise about Ishmael, that now, now she can sort of say it with, with uh, conviction that you are surely the God who sees. I, I just found that, that really um, an important uh, thing there. Um, any other names that you see here? Sort of a trick question, not, not really, but one is Lord. Um, if you notice in your Bibles, it's probably uh, Lord is all capitalized um, because it, it's really the, the tetragrammaton there, the, the, the word for, for Yahweh um, that, that usually in, in English Bibles is written as Lord in all capitals as opposed to the Lord with just the first word, letter capitalized or something, right? This is the, the, the personal name of God um, that, that he gives uh, that's uh, sometimes translated as Jehovah. Um, if you turn the Y into a J and use different vowels, you know, because in Hebrew they didn't give vowels, and so we had to guess for a while, and we think we've gotten it now that it really is pronounced more, you're like, more like Yahweh, but uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, really the same name. Um, 
And, and in fact, even, even today, um, uh, Jewish people will not say the name Yahweh, right? They will, uh, or some will not even spell it out uh, completely, right? They'll, they'll leave some of the, the letters out or some of the symbols out um, because they believe that, that God's name, his personal name is so holy uh, that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be spoken. Um, yeah, so, and then the, the other one here is, you know, she names a well, uh, which is kind of cool. So this is, uh, you know, the, she names this well the, the Beer Lahai Roy, uh, which you see that same ending, Roy. So this is the God who sees, but this is the living and seeing God, or the, the, the living God who sees, or the God who lives and sees. It's a, but the same sort of idea of she's taking this and, and naming this spot and saying, this is the place where I came into contact with the God who lives, you know, is living and active, and who sees me. And, and I think that that's a, a really neat thing. Um, I, I wish that we were more in the practice of this sort of thing. Uh, I'm not very much in the practice. I'm not, not necessarily like in the, like naming specific spots on the earth, you know, that sort of thing. But I mean like celebrating what God does in our lives. Um, I don't know, do any of you do that in any way that you, you'd like to, to share? Do you have a, a practice of celebrating how God works in your life? So I had a, um, a professor when I was in college who told us how, how they would do that in their family. You know, most families, you celebrate birthdays, you celebrate anniversaries, um, you know, these sorts of things. They would actually, like on their calendar, they had certain days that were marked off as special days, not because of someone was born or, or something that, but that was a day where God solved a problem for them. Like whether it was, um, you know, something they had been going through as a family that, that uh, you know, was resolved or, you know, that maybe they got a job that they had, had really been praying a lot about. You know, God answered some prayer. And so they would mark that day on their calendar and say, okay, July 22nd is now a holiday for our family. And we're going to mark this place as a place where we've come into contact with God. And God has been an active and living God in our lives. I always thought that was a really neat idea. I haven't really followed through with, <laughs> with, with our family. Uh, but I really love that idea of taking those times when God uh, comes down, touches our lives, interacts with us, and changes us. And, and not just like moving away from those times and just being like, oh yeah, that happened a long time ago. But like putting those markers, and not, not as things that we worship, not as things that we, you know, that would, you know, put on other people that they have to do, but just something for me, something for me and my family uh, that's a reminder of, of, of who God is and what he does. There's good things working in our life. I feel like that would be beneficial for us to kind of do that. Like you don't have to say today's. December 25th is the day that something happened, but like just to share when you, you see God working, because sometimes we don't. We just say, today is a day that I need help. Maybe we need to more often say, today is a day I receive help. I think that's an awesome uh, suggestion. And uh, I, I think uh, even like some of our devotionals, like on Sunday nights, how awesome would it be if some of those were, were just testimonials about, here's what God did in my life this week. Um, I think that would be really cool. Hopefully someone, uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk to the elders, see if we can do something about that. <laughs> yeah. I've always thought it would be neat to see some of the altars that may still exist, or Jacob's well that actually supposedly does still exist. There's places where people have, come, have decided to erect a statue, or not a statue, but a monument that says, I encountered God here, and that just, that would be almost unsettling just mm -hmm. to be at that location. Yeah, and, and, and again, we, you know, we have to be careful that we don't, uh, we wouldn't let those sort of physical things like become a, 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 a place of idol worship or something, right? We, we don't want to tie our faith to, to something like that, but I think as a, um, as a reminder, as just a, a, a thing, you know, because like it or not, we are physical people, you know, trapped in these physical bodies that forget things and that we, we need reminders, we need those, those sorts of things. And, and again, as a, as a tool that we would use, right, to, to help us.
I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I, I think that, um, you know, as long as we, you know, keep that understanding of, of, of God being a, a, a spiritual God and, and not that he, you know, not thinking, like our buildings are a good example of that, right? We, we all know that there, there are some times where it's very peaceful to come and sit and pray in a church building, right? Especially if that's a building where you've had a lot of experiences and, you know, there are certain places that just mean things to us or, um, you know, it, it could be somewhere where you've gone with someone and, and um, you've spent meaningful time, you know, in reflection and meditation or something in a particular place. I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as we don't tr try to like put God in a box, right? And say that like God only comes and meets us here or that he, you know, I, I, you can only go and, and find peace at a particular place or something like that. But I think as a tool, there's nothing wrong with it as, as long as we're careful to, to keep that distinction in our, in our heads. Yes, Dan? It's kind of interesting that Jesus often went to the garden and it seems to in the text, so he went there a lot. That was kind of his place was seemingly a special prayer, and so that was where he went to the night in which he was betrayed. Um, a place where he was very close to God. And he found very peace there, and it's there that he began his passion. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, one final point in this section. Uh, it's really significant that Abram at the end of this section uh, calls Ishmael, uh, calls the child by the name Ishmael. Uh, this is him publicly acknowledging uh, that Ishmael is his son, that there's a, a public acknowledgement. You know, it, if you imagine what happened here, you know, Hagar comes back and say, hey, I ran into this angel. Uh, she said I should call the kid Ishmael. And, you know, y y we have to understand that, that Abram uh, then took this and said, yes, this is accepted by God, um, even though it wasn't his plan. This is an acceptable thing to God that he accept him as his son and publicly acknowledge him. And that was an important thing for Ishmael, um, being not ostracized in, in Abram's house, even though he wasn't the child of promise, uh, that he was still uh, very much a part of Abram's house. And, and we'll, we'll see in a, um, a few minutes, um, you know, what it, that Abram even even tries to argue with God a little bit and say, you know, what about Ishmael? Yeah. I'm always amazed at, you know, the faith of people to, like, continue on with stuff. Can you imagine if you were told what she was told in verse 12? <laughs> Before your child was born, that your child's going to be the wild donkey of a man and everybody's hand's going to be against him? <laughs> like, how would, you, how would you like to be told that of your child before they're even born? Like... We, we read a lot of those things and we kind of just accept them, but you imagine if you were in her shoes, what that must have felt like? You know? Yeah, a little bittersweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, thank you, God. I'm so happy I'm going to have a child. Um, can we change that last part just a little bit? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And, you know, it has certainly borne out to be true. Uh, by Ishmael, and not only Ishmael, but his, his descendants. And there have uh, been, you know, strife and, and uh, friction in that part of the world uh, since that time. And so, but but, the, but you're, you're right, I've never really thought about Hagar processing all of that, <laughs> understanding what, what was likely to come. Okay, so, so let's jump down to chapter 17. Um, could someone read uh, verses 1 through 8 for us? Did you have a comment, or you... Yes, please do. Uh, I thought it was interesting and good that you noted that she talked about the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, and all that, uh, those, that name. Uh, as you know, uh, I think it's worth pointing out over in Exodus 6 that when God had come to Moses later, uh, God told Moses in verse uh, 2, I am the Lord, all caps, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Now, the NIV says fully known to them. That's very significant. It, when you read that, you might get confused because the Lord, all caps, is used a lot in Genesis. And he talked to Abraham using that word. And it's called that. And Abraham apparently knew him that. So it looks like 
And what is he saying over in Exodus 6? And apparently, that name, because of what he was going to do through Moses, this redemptive, uh, this great redemption he's going to bring back through, through Israel, the name just take, took on a uh, new significance. Uh, although it had been used before, it would now acquire a special uh, meaning because of the redemptive revelation involved, because of what it's going to do to Moses. And that's I think that's why the NIV says, I did not make myself fully known to them. In other words, the fullness of that of that personal name would come out more when they would see his great work in redeeming the nation. So, and I think that's helpful, because I remember I read that, I thought, wait a minute, did he use it? Yahweh a lot back there, and he did, but he's just using it in a little bit newer way in, in Exodus 6. Yeah, that, that's a that's great point. I had forgotten that. Uh, if I, I don't know if I've ever made that connection. I appreciate you, you bringing that out. You know, it could be sort of back to Dave's point earlier that that a little bit of this was uh, almost revisionist. And, the, you know, Moses, as writing this, uh, he calls God Yahweh. And that, that it may be that as he's writing this, he, um, it's very... Uh, uh, common and natural for him to refer to him as Yahweh. Uh, whether God revealed Himself to Abram as Yahweh, I don't. I don't know if we're if we're told that He did. Um, I don't know. Do Do you know? I'll th- it's just that it's used in the in the narrative over and over again. Right. Right. I think, I think Abram himself even calls him. Yahweh. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. I'll have to check that out. I'm pretty sure he does. Okay. So that's a, that's a good one. We can do some homework on, <laughs> on that one. I'll, I'll look that up too. Um, so in, in you, you actually you, you bring out um, one of the names we're going to see in the next. You, you talked about one of the ones we're going to see in the next uh, little section here. Um, could someone read uh, 17, uh, 1 through 8 for us? Sure, Charles. Now when Abram was 19, 99 years old, The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of of a multitude of nations. How far? Uh, through eight. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants, after you, thir- after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Thank you. So we, we see two new names come up in here. Uh, the first one is the one that, that Stan brought up, and this is the first time we see this in Scripture in 17.1, uh, when, when God appears and he says, I am God Almighty, or El Shaddai is the, the, the Hebrew name there. There was an old Amy Grant song uh, years ago that, that you might have heard, um, and that's the, the God all-powerful, the the mighty one. You know, one uh, tip is that if you see God name himself in a particular area, it's probably going to be important for the, the story that's going there. Not, not only for what's going to happen, but for the way that we should understand and, and apply this to our lives. And so when we think about this whole passage, I think we need to understand that God himself was, was saying that his power was what he was trying to make manifest in, in what was happening through this his work here. And so, um, you know, when we understand what was going on with Abram, and, and I guess now, now I can start, I can switch over to call him uh, Abraham, uh, which is, I've been trying really hard not to call him Abraham. It's been tough. Uh, but the, uh, the God working through uh, Abraham, and, and uh, I guess I have to still call her Sarai, um, because we haven't gotten there yet. But uh, the way that he showed his power and demonstrated his power and his ability to uh, take a closed womb and to have them uh, conceive a child is, is just 
amazing, it's supernatural, it's not something that uh, could have been explained by other things that were going on. And, and God was wanting, the, one of the reasons that the way that they tried to solve it was wrong was because it didn't let God get the glory for what was going to happen. God wanted to do it in a particular way so that the start of that lineage, the start of that family uh, would be done in this really powerful way that, that he would be uh, glorified through. Not that they would be able to say, well, we got the solution. God, you know, I know you made the promise. We figured it out. Um, but this is a way that, that God was the one who was given the glory. And people were able for generations to look back and say, do you remember Abraham and Sarah and the, the way that God worked through them, uh, even though they were, they were old? Um, the, uh, the, there are, depending on, I tried to Google this this afternoon, uh, something anywhere from 10 to 70 to over 100 of these sort of names of God. Uh, it, it would be a really interesting study sometime to go through all the different names of God. Um, I think, but here, you know, it's very, um, a lot of them are uh, very characteristic based. It's where God wants to emphasize a different part of his character in a different uh, uh, situation. So sometimes uh, he'll call himself a healer. He'll call himself, uh, you know, the uh, the one who. Um, well, we we saw the the earlier the God who sees, or you know, there are these these different facets of who God is that give us sort of this picture, this overall picture of who God is and how He works in our lives. And and as, as Stan pointed out, the 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 personal name that He has, that He revealed to, to Moses, uh, Yahweh, as as another name. Um, and, and then Abraham, you know, changing it from exalted father uh, to father of multitude. And so that, that yeah, I think this is another way of God just emphasizing that, no, really, I'm going to do it. And you're, you're going to actually have this, this promised, you know, nations that are going to come out uh, from your lineage. And uh, I think it's, it's really interesting um, to think about uh, what God's response to Abram and, and Sarai's uh, Poor decisions says about him. So maybe I should uh, open that up. What, what do you think? What, what do you think about the way God responded in this setting? Um, so, so here we had Abram and Sarai who said, well, we're going to take this into our own hands. And God, he responds by not only uh, being very gracious to Ishmael, uh, but by then still remaining faithful to his promise that he made. So, so what does that tell us about God? What should we get out of that? How does that impact our lives? About Peter, for example, you know, he wanted to take things in his hand when he didn't want Christ to wash his feet. Yeah, he had a better way until he found out. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah, and, and similarly, um, you know, God in the form of Jesus, you know, responded with grace, right, and and told him that he was wrong, uh, but but also, um, you know. The, in, in not only uh, not only then, but you know, Peter's life is a great example in how, you know, even when when Peter disowned Jesus, that, that uh, Jesus restored him then later. And to do things their way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the the thing that I take away from it is that that God will He'll work around us in a sense that He knows we're going to make mistakes. It's not a surprise to Him that we're going to make mistakes and fall short of, of what he wants for us, and that he will remain faithful, that he's going to keep his promises, not because of us, not because of the things that we do, uh, in spite of us. And so no, no matter whether we're able to, to do everything that we want to do or not, um, that, that he's going to, to keep his, his, uh, his, his promises to us. So we're, we're about out of time um, I know this has been really dry tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'll tell you, that. so here's what the other option was. The parts that I skipped over here were about circumcision. I, I really was like this close to having a whole lesson on circumcision uh, because there's some really interesting things there. Um, if you think about like, uh, for one thing, so I did look, look, look trivia. 
Uh, circumcision was, was not invented by the Hebrews, so this was not like the first time. Uh, there's evidence all the way back to like the 26th century uh, BC that the Egyptians were performing circumcision as a, for the people who would work in the tombs. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about why circumcision, like why would God use that as a mark of his covenant? What I really like, if you read the, the last part of chapter 17 here, where after Abraham, you know, hears about the covenant and what God wants him to do, he has to go back to his house, like round up all the men. And you just imagine how that conversation must have gone. Like here, all these men come out, they're like, okay, Abraham's been talking to God. Uh, what kind of great promise, you know, he's going to be our shield. He's going to, you know, do these great things. And Abraham's like, we're going to get circumcised. <laughs> and <laughs> That's right. And you just, uh, I really wonder, you know, sometimes you read scripture and you just know there were some things left out. Um, I think that's one of those times where there were definitely some, some things left out there in, in that conversation and, and what happened there. But what we also see there, and I think that's another theme uh, as we see here, is, is Abraham's obedience. Uh, that, that was not a fun thing for him to do. <laughs> it was probably less fun for him to do to his 13-year-old boy Ishmael <laughs> and the rest of his house. Uh, but he did it anyway, because it's what God wanted him to do. Because God has always, always, always uh, demanded us to be willing to do the things that he sets in front of us to do. He doesn't demand that we're perfect. He doesn't demand that we, we always get it right. Uh, but he does want us to be, to be willing. And so I, I think overall, we see this really beautiful story. Like if we, if we put all this together, we've got, you know, Abram and Sarai, you know, making these horrible decisions that just mess up their lives, and poor Hagar gets dragged into it and has these horrible things, and then we get the, you know, the wild donkey of a man that, you know, comes out of it, and Ishmael sort of is, is thrust into this stuff, and we see God in the background, you know, weaving things together, making it work out uh, so that his promises will be fulfilled and that, that everything will be okay and that it'll still work out. And I, I wanted us to close by uh, reading in uh, Galatians, uh, something that Paul wrote. This is in, in Galatians chapter 3, um, starting verse 23. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul did a nice job of tying this all up for us today, because uh, when we are baptized, we put on the name of Jesus. That when we walk around this world, uh, just the, the way that these folks in the Old Testament had these names that meant things and uh, had a powerful uh, impact on their lives, when we wear the name of Jesus, uh, we have to understand that we're wearing that for everyone to see. Uh, but that we're, so that's one part of it, right? That we have to be aware of the appearance of, of what our lives look like to those who are not Christians as we wear that name Christ uh, on us. Uh, but we also have to know that we wear that in the sense that, in the same sense that Hagar was able to, to call God and say, you're the God that sees. We're able to wear Christ and say, you're the God who sanctifies. You're the God who saves. And that that's a powerful thing that we have to, to always have in front of us as part of our understanding of who we are now, is that we have met Jesus at the cross and that he has impacted our lives just in the same way uh, that he impacted Hagar's life. Any final thoughts? The name Christian, we call Christians, so that kind of goes with what you're saying. But also, we're baptized in Matthew 28 into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means we come under the possession, the possession of God. To uh, come under the name in the ancient world was to title you own it and so we come under the ownership of God and that yeah, thank you let's close with prayer father we are so thankful to to be your children to be able to be grafted into the the, the lineage of Abraham and 
uh, as we read these, these old stories and try to understand what it was that, that Moses was writing and why he was writing it to the Israelites and, and what we should understand from it and, and trying to understand these names and what they mean and, and what they meant then and what they mean to us now. Father, we, just, we pray that you would give us a, a deeper appreciation for who you are and how you work and the, the ways that you have always impacted people and the ways that you continue to impact people. I, I pray that, that you will bless uh, each of us this week, that you will help us to, to wear the name of Jesus uh, in a way that brings glory and honor to you and to your name. Uh, we praise you and honor you, and, and uh, we ask this all in the, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So next week, I think we get Sodom and Gomorrah, so that should be fun. <laughs> Can I hold everybody here for a second? We just got a phone call we want to share with you. Uh, I'd like for us to go...